Good evening, everyone. It's so good to see you again. My name is Allison. I'm Director of Education at the National First Ladies Library. We're located at the National First Ladies Historic Site in Canton, Ohio. And this is our children's program. It's called Fun with Flotus. Um, if you haven't checked it out before, we do have a bunch of recorded classes and activities on YouTube that you can take a look at. And we've been doing a few of these live um, installments during the pandemic for special holidays and events. So if you were with me last time, you may have been here during um, the, the Christmas time. And we were talking about Christmas at the White House. And I'm super excited to be talking about 4th of July or Independence Day with you today and discuss some of the ways that First Ladies have celebrated the events as well as um, read a story, look at a, a craft activity, and uh, we will also be playing a little game. So I'm in webinar format tonight, which means you can see me, but I can't see you. But I also have some questions for you. Um, we're gonna use polls and our chat today. So if you have an adult with you or a grown up with you who can type and chat with us, if you wanna say where you're from in the chat and give a little hello, you're welcome to. But I have a question for you because we're going to look at some of the ways that first ladies and first families celebrate uh, 4th of July. And I wanna know how you celebrate the 4th of July. What is your favorite thing to do? So I'm going to resume my screen share because I wanna show you the pictures I have up. And I wanna ask you, what is your favorite way to celebrate July 4th? And you can answer in the chat too, if you want to, if there's something really specific you want to share with me. Um, do you love to go to a parade? Do you like to watch fireworks? Do you like to go to a baseball game or a cookout or a special concert? I love to go see the symphony play and watch the fireworks. I think it's so fun. So you tell me and I'll tell you a few different things that some first ladies have done as we do our poll here during the holiday. And um, if you can see on my screen, I have Nancy Reagan, who was first lady when I was a little kid, maybe your age. And Nancy Reagan has a birthday right around July 4th, just a day or two later. So she often combined the festivities at the White House for July 4th with a birthday celebration. So she'd celebrate with her friends and then they'd go out on the lawn of the White House and sit and watch fireworks and enjoy things. So I'm gonna pull up our poll here and we'll take a look. It looks like you all liked fireworks. Fireworks came in up at the top. Cookout is up there. Parade. Parades are so fun, right? So let's see. We will close up our poll and I'll have another one for you in a second. And let's see if we can move forward. Oh, one of the things I wanted to mention to you besides the YouTube activities that you can watch, we have some special kits that you can sign up for via Eventbrite um, inspired by the First Ladies. So they're special growing seed kits inspired by Michelle Obama, 
Eleanor Roosevelt and Lady Bird Johnson and they have activities. So um, that's a little plug for those. The Michelle Obama was available for June and is still available. And we're just rolling out our Lady Bird. We're making really cool seed balls. So I have to plug that, but then I'll get back. We know that there was some growing going on on the South Lawn of the White House. We know that there's a garden out there. So we also know that a lot of times it's a setting around July 4th for watching really cool fireworks displays. So here you can see Michelle Obama and Barack Obama enjoying watching the fireworks on the National Mall. And this is back in the 1970s. In 1976, the Ford family was actually able to celebrate the United States birthday all year long because it was the bicentennial. So they were celebrating 200 years of the US. So there were lots of fireworks and celebrations and First Lady Betty Ford was involved in a lot of them. So that is pretty cool. Yeah, and it has been really rainy. Sometimes those rainstorms impact the firework celebrations, don't they? So let's see, here's another image of some First Lady activities. Um, so here is the Carter family with Amy Carter, first kid in the center, participating in a parade. So sometimes parades are part of our July 4th celebration. And July 4th celebrations go all the way back to at the White House to Thomas Jefferson, who opened up the White House and encouraged people to come and celebrate um, the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And the First Lady at the time was actually hostess, a future First Lady, Dolly Madison. And she is a really fun hostess, so I'm sure it was a wonderful party. And here you can see a parade with bands and um, lots of activity here and the Carters participating. And the 4th of July is sometimes about getting out and campaigning going to festivals and activities and talking up your family member who may be a candidate if you're a first lady or in Hillary Clinton's case, she was running for um, Senate when she ran, was first lady and she also ran for president. So here she is celebrating the fourth, visiting with some people on the campaign trail and we mentioned that baseball uh, was another activity. People love to go to baseball games on the 4th of July. And the Bush family really loves baseball. And Barbara Bush, for former First Lady Barbara Bush, absolutely loves to attend baseball games with her family and was known to keep score of the games on a scorecard. So here she is throwing out a first pitch at the game. She looks really patriotic and like she's having a lot of fun. And then a lot of times there's a concert, right? At the White House, we mentioned that. And there's a special band. The Marines have their own band that is often referred to as the president's own band. And that music I played at the beginning of the class was actually composed by the fa most famous conductor of that band named John Philip Sousa. And he created all sorts of marches. And that one you we usually hear during the fireworks if we go to a concert on 4th of July. And you can see here at the White House, um, not that long ago, you can see First Lady Melania Trump along with her family uh, looking on at the Marine uh, Band. So those are some ways that First Ladies celebrate. And I did mention that we have a craft activity tonight. So I'm gonna send you a little packet that has all of the materials that um, and, and information that um, we are discussing tonight. If you aren't able to do this along with me and I'm kind of gonna demonstrate it really quickly for you so we can get to some of the other stuff. But 
one of our favorite things that we mentioned were fireworks for the 4th of July, right? And you can make your own fireworks. If it's rainy and you can't go outside, you can make fireworks in a jar. And we're gonna do that tonight. I have a big thing of warm water heated up. And I have a jar here with my water in it. And it's nice and warm, you can see the steam. And then I've got another container. And my container is filled with olive oil. Can you see that? I put about a few tablespoons, three tablespoons of olive oil in my container. And then last but not least, I've got some food coloring. So if you, oh, you can't see my demonstration, I'm gonna stop my share, you're right. So you can see me a little bit bigger here on the screen and hopefully you can give me a thumbs up in the chat if you can. So I've got my container filled with a hot water. I've got my olive oil here too. And I've got my food coloring. So if you have a very favorite type of firework, favorite color, let me know in the chat. I'm going to take red to begin with because it's nice and bright and I like fireworks because they remind me of abstract art and at the White House there's a really cool painting by an artist named Alma Thomas and it kind of reminds me of the colors that I'm using. She has some paintings that look kind of like fireworks. So I'm putting some red and some blue in. And if you're following along with me, you might just put a four dots of whatever color you wanna use. I would recommend using multiple. And can you see what's happening? So this is oil and this food coloring is water-based, right? So instead of kind of stretching out and going everywhere, it's made these crazy little tiny balls. So I'm gonna add a little more. I'm gonna add green this time. And then we'll go to the next step, okay? And if you're following along at home, tell me what colors you would add. And now that I've got this container with my little tiny balls of food coloring in it, I'm going to take a spoon or a fork and just try to break them up a little. Make them into even smaller balls, just like so. I don't want to do too many because we've got a few other things to do tonight. And what do you think is going to happen when I pour my oil into that water. Any ideas? Anybody have an idea? This looks kind of dense, right? Kind of thick, this oil. And water is different density, right? So I'm gonna pour my oil and my food coloring in. And it usually takes a minute. You have to kind of let it sit. But what's going to happen is, and I don't have a lot of water in there, but you're going to get a cool fireworks show. So you're going to get a display where the oil and water kind of separate. And you can see I used a lot of red. It's kind of sitting there on the top. But yours is going to look even cooler. Mine's kind of hard to see there. It's the power of Zoom, huh? Um, but you can kind of see the colors start to go down. It's really fun. And I recommend playing your John Philip Sousa while you do this when you're ready to go. This is recorded too. So we'll be able to share it after the fact. I see someone asking in the chat. So that is the art activity for the night. The other two things I have for you are a story and also a scavenger hunt. So we've talked a little bit about what first ladies do 
and how they celebrate with their families on the 4th of July. But we want a little more, we want to know a little more about the background of the 4th of July, right? About what happens at that time period, right? So I have actually another question for you because we know about some of the figures, right? Um, major figures during the founding of our country. But I wanna talk to you about one of those figures. So have you heard of Paul Revere before? In the chat, you'll see the question, have you heard of Paul Revere? And I see a lot of yeses. And then the second question is, have you ever heard of Sybil Lundington? So a few people have. And some of us have heard of Paul Revere and some of us haven't. So tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the women who helped during the founding of the United States of America during the Revolutionary War. So some of them were first ladies and some of them aren't that well known. And some of them might not be well known because at that time period, women didn't always go to school. They didn't have the same rights that men did and education wasn't a priority for them. So often they didn't know how to read and sometimes they didn't write. And so their stories and histories aren't written down. So Paul Revere is known pretty well around the country as being a patriot because he traveled by horseback to warn people that the British soldiers were coming, right? To gather militia, to gather troops. And guess what? Sybil Londington did the same thing. In fact, she rode her horse even further than Paul Revere. And she is just a kid at the time. So let's see, we're gonna end our poll here. We'll share our results. And then I've got a story to share with you about Sybil. So I am going to share my screen again. If I can here, give me one second. I'm gonna open up my presentation. Go back to share screen. Thank you for being so patient. Here we go. There we go. Okay, so I have a special story for you this evening. It's called Sybil's Night Ride. And it is the story of Sybil Londington, who I was just telling you about. So we'll read that story and then we'll talk about some of the other women as we play a special game. So here is the beginning of our story. Sybil slipped out to the barn to check on the colt, Star. Overhead, low dark clouds were gathering. She stroked Star's neck and mane. Imagine, she said, father has been gone all these weeks in search of supplies for his militia. Tonight, he will finally be home. Wait until he sees how well I have you trained. Back by the kitchen hearth, Sybil helped her mother set down the pewter plates for dinner. As Sybil lit the candles, there was a the sound of hoofbeat. She ran down the porch steps. Large drops of rain were falling. Father, she shouted, father is home. Her mother and younger brothers and sisters rushed out to greet him. All through supper, heavy rain pelted the roof and window panes. Father told about the supplies of medicine, clothing, and gunpowder he had secured for his militia. Everyone asked questions. Was it dangerous? Are there enough guns? Are the supplies well hidden? Father was explaining that more hiding places needed to be found when suddenly someone pounded on the door. 
Sybil turned to the mantel clock. It was past nine. Who could it be? A young man drenched with rain and mud stood on the porch. Colonel Ludington, the British are burning Danbury. He stopped to catch his breath. Look, he pointed east. A huge red fireball glowed in the sky. The storehouse, father cried, our supplies. The redcoats are marching this way, warned the messenger. They must be turned back. I have 400 men throughout the country, said father. It is urgent they are called to muster. The messenger shook his head. My horse and I can ride no farther this night. Father frowned. I must remain here to ready the men to march. Sybil listened closely. Someone was needed to call out the Patriots. She would be brave brave like father. She stepped forward. I can go, father. I can ride the colt. For the whole month you were gone, I rode every day. It is too dangerous, father said. The men are scattered far from one another. But I know the way, insisted Sybil. I know the farms of our patriots. There could be spies along the way, said mother, or worse, thieves and skinners. Father shook his head. This is no night for a young girl to ride alone. But there is no one else, Sybil touched father's arm. Please let me go. Father looked out the window at the fiery red sky. Then he turned and looked at his wife. He sighed. Sybil, hurry and dress in warm clothing, he said. Mother and I will wait for you in the barn. Sybil pulled on her father's old breeches and tucked them into her boots. She threw on her cloak and hat and dashed through the puddles to the barn. Father slid a blanket onto Star's back, a blanket and saddle onto Star's back. Sybil tightened the cinch. She put on the bridle, threw back the hemp reins and jumped on. Be careful, said mother, tucking a small pouch of bread and cheese inside Sybil's cloak. Father squeezed her hand. First head east, then south. Stay to the roads. When you get to the farm of a patriot, alert him and ride on quickly. God be with you, my daughter. One thing I love about the book is you can see the texture of what the artist painted on. It's very cool, but also there's a lot of action and motion. We can see the rain and we can feel what it might have been like for Sybil, huh? Sybil slapped Star's flank. He took off at a gallop past Father's grist mill. He crossed the rain-soaked fields. Mud splashed up over Sybil's boots, sopping her legs. She pressed Star towards the narrow trail between the birches and kept her head low. Water poured down from the night sky. It dripped off the brim of Sybil's hat and drenched her cloak. She shivered. Rain and darkness blurred the trail. Sybil rode for a long time over patches of slippery leaves. Careful, Star, she said, but Star seemed to veer by instinct along the narrow turns. Strands of wet hair stuck to Sybil's face. She pushed them back and wiped the cold rain from her cheeks. A roaring sound came through the trees. Star's ears pricked up. It's only the mill stream. Sybil said gently. They traveled the path south along the rain swollen stream. Star stepped through deep mud. His hooves made slushing noises. Slush, slush, slush. Sybil urged him on. She thought how much father was counting on her. Would she and Star make it? She swallowed the lump in her throat, gulp, and then shouted, Faster, Star, faster. A loud rustling came from the trees. Star jerked back. Sybil gripped the reins. Steady, boy. A deer suddenly leaped out and crossed their path. On and on they went, following the curve of the stream. They headed west. There's the deer. Finally, they neared a farmhouse. It belongs to one of father's men, said Sybil. 
She broke off a branch of a tree. Swiftly, she rode up and banged the branch on the door. Bang, bang, bang. Ma muster at Londington's, she shouted. The glow from a candle shone in a window. The door opened and a man came out. Muster at Londington's, Sybil cried. The British are burning Danbury. The man waved and Sybil rode on. She turned star onto the path heading north uphill through the dense woods. The wind whistled eerily. Sky and trees together were black as coal. Sybil knew it would be easy to lose her way and thieves could be lurking. Holding tight, she leaned close to Star's back. We can do it, Star. Climbing, Star panted as he made his way through the wet, thick brush. Twigs split and snapped, scratching Sybil's arm. One star stumbled on a rock. Sybil, Sybil slid from the saddle to check his leg. It seemed like forever before they began to travel down the slope. At the bottom of the hill, a clearing appeared. Several farmhouses were set behind a wooden fence. Finally, taking a deep breath, Sybil gripped her branch. She rode up to the closest house and banged on the door. Muster at Londington's. She rapped on the door, one after the other. The British are burning Danbury. She pointed east, see the red sky? Dogs barked, horses whinnied. One by one, candles were lit. Doors open, people holding lanterns peered out. Turn back the red coat, Sybil cried. Muster at Lunnington's. Farther down the road, she banged on the door of the blacksmith's house. She rode up the Cooper's to the Cooper's house, then to the Tanner's. Muster at Lunnington's, she shouted again and again. Men ran out. They grabbed their muskets and saddled their horses. Sybil rode on past the cemetery, along the edge of the lake, rippling with rain. Ahead, pastors stretched out, separated by low stone walls. More and more houses appeared. Over and over, Sybil cried out to the patriots, hurry, come muster, go to Lunnington's, turn back the red coat. Close to the road stood a barn. The door abruptly opened and a man carrying a lantern and a pail walked out. Sybil shuddered. It was a loyalist farmer, father suspected of being a British spy. She slid off the saddle and grabbed Star's halter. Quickly, she turned him back to a clump of trees. Star stepped on a branch. Loudly, it cracked. Crack! Who's out there? The man called. Holding Star tightly, Sybil stood frozen behind a thick tree trunk. She watched the man head towards her. Her heart hammered in her chest. Is anyone there? The man asked. His footsteps trampled the underbrush. At any moment, he would find them. Sybil clenched her teeth and held her breath. Everything will be lost. Woo! An owl hooted. Woo! The man stopped. Just an old owl. He turned and went back inside the barn, closing the door behind him. Sybil flung herself up on the saddle. Hurry, she urged. Star began to trot. Faster, boy. Sybil rode on. All through the night, she gave her alarm. Muster at Lunnington's. Turn back the red coats. Her voice grew hoarse. Light was slowly spreading through the sky as Sybil turned away from the last farmhouse. The rain softened to a drizzle. Sybil hunched over Star and he slackened his pace. Her body ached. They started for home. It was a long way back. At last, she reached the Lunnington farm. Sybil pulled Star to a halt. Groups of men were forming ranks. Father stood in the middle of the field, shouting orders. He turned, Sybil. Oh, let me show you the picture. There she is. He hurried over and helped her dismount. 
Then he gave her a long hug. The men cheered. Hooray for Sybil! Sybil rubbed Star's neck. We did it, Star, we did it. Sybil Lunnington made her ride on April 26, 1777, through what is known now as Central Putnam County, New York. Sometime later, it was reported that General George Washington visited her home to praise her brave deed. So that's our story about Sybil Lennington. It's called Sybil's Night Ride, and it was written and illustrated by Karen Winnick. So I thought it was a really fun book because it really expresses that ride and how hard it was. That dark night with lots of rain. So Sybil is one of those characters who we don't know that much about. But there's actually a monument and a sculpture to her. Now, I'm gonna show you a few other ladies that are important as well and underlooked or not well known and part of those women who helped during the revolution. Some of them are well known because two of them are first ladies and a few of them I had never heard of before. But what we're going to do tonight, if you want to play along with me, is we're going to do a little scavenger hunt. So for each of these ladies that I tell you about, I'm going to have you go find me something around the room of your house. All of these things you should have in your home that kind of relates to this lady. So this is the first one, and I'm going to put another poll up on the screen that's going to help us. Let's see. I'll stop sharing this one and let's close that poll and see if we can get our other one. Oh, did I not share this one? No, I want to show you the second one here is our scavenger hunt. So here we go. So the first woman we're going to show you, this shows you everything. So we're just going to do one at a time and we'll go through. Sorry about that. So the woman that you see up on the screen, her name is Patience Lavelle Wright. And she is such a cool woman. She is probably the very first sculptor in the United States. And she's best known for making these kinds of wax sculptures. If you've ever been to a wax museum, you might have seen one, sometimes a president or first lady or famous person. So she traveled to Britain with Benjamin Franklin, and he introduced her to all of these well-known British people. And she would sculpt them in wax. And as she was sculpting them, she would hear these stories about what was happening. So if the British were thinking of sending troops somewhere specific, something was going to happen, she took that um, information, wrote it down, and when she was sending her sculptures back that were wax back to the United States, she would roll up pieces of paper with that information and put them inside the wax and hide them. So the first thing that I want you to find around your house, and you can look at the question number one, Patience Lavelle Wright was a spy for the colonists. She sent secret messages in her wax sculpture. Can you find an object around your house that is used to clean up wax? Can you find something? And then it asks you for the first one, what did you find? So someone, what did you find? It looks like someone found a cotton ball. And I'll give you just a second while I'm doing that. This is what I found. I found a Q-tip. So Patience Lavelle Wright, this Q-tip's for you. And it looks like someone found a cotton ball. And if you want to share something else you found or something you thought of, if you're not even running around, you're welcome to. Someone said toilet paper. I think some of these are meant to be silly, though. Sometimes they didn't relate and sometimes they did. So the first one's kind of silly. But you could use toilet paper to clean up black, right? 
if you had a candle spell. So let's look at our next woman. Now here's a woman that you've probably heard of before, right? This is a portrait of Abigail Adams. She was a first lady and she was a very brilliant woman. And she wrote lots of letters to her husband because her husband was traveling. He was working on helping to establish a new country. And he was a very loving husband. He liked to write a lot of letters to Abigail and share what he was thinking. And he was also really interested in what Abigail was thinking. And one of the things that she was thinking and really wanted to tell him was, hey, you know what, as you're writing these founding documents, like the Declaration of Independence, maybe you should be thinking about women. Maybe we should include women in them and give them equal rights to men. So that was something that she asked her husband to do. It's something that he didn't do, but Abigail is really well known for being a great advocate um, and speaking up for women and women's education. So in honor of Abigail Adams, we want you to find an item in your house inspired by her writing her letters to her husband. And if you want to run around your house, and see what you can find. I've got a few things in my poll. You can tell me in the chat too, if you want what you found, if you found something totally different that I didn't think of that related. So I found an envelope to send my letter and I found a sheet of stamps to send. And maybe you found a pen too. It looks like someone found a pen. So thank you for participating in our hunt. And you're welcome to keep moving along with me here. I'm going to tell you about another really groundbreaking woman during the Revolutionary War. Her name is Deborah Sampson. And she became a war hero when she disguised herself as a man to serve in the Continental Army. She fought in several battles before they figured out who she was. Uh, she was wounded and then she was identified as being a woman and she was sent um, home. But she is actually the very first woman ever to receive a military pension. So she got money from the US government and she also went on a speaking tour. So as I'm telling you about her, can you think of something that you might find in your house inspired by her? So she had to put on a disguise, right? To be a soldier. So what have you found inspired by her? And I wish I could see what you found. Maybe you have a Halloween mask or costume. Here's what I found. If I didn't want people to know who I was, I might put on a hat. I might put on some sunglasses and kind of go incognito. We've seen some first ladies do that before when they didn't want people to notice them or see them. So that's my disguise for the evening. And if you want to share your disguise, it looks like a lot of people found some hats. So very cool. Let's see our next person. So she's also a very well-known person. We talk a lot about our founding father, George Washington, but this is his wife, First Lady Martha Washington. And Martha didn't want to sit at home during the war, right? It was really important for her to travel to where her husband was and set up a home there at Valley Forge. She ordered supplies, she organized meals at his headquarters, and 
she met with the officers' wives and helped boost morale, helped people feel good when it was the dead of winter and people were hungry and cold. So she had a, a pretty important role um, during that time. Now, what I want you to find relates to George because we don't really have a coin at the moment in circulation um, that has Martha on it, but at one time I think there was, and maybe there will be soon because I heard there are some coins with women coming out. So I want you to look around your house and see if you have an image of George. Maybe you wanna tell me in the chat that you found an image of Martha in your house, but everybody has some kind of George Washington representation in their house, even if it's not a picture on a wall because he's on a lot of our money. So I have this quarter that I found. And if you have a dollar bill, you may have a really nice portrait of George in your house. Or maybe you have a postcard or a book. Remember, I have that picture book because I've got the Sybil with the George um, picture on the last page. So Martha played a, a pretty important role um, as the first first lady and being supportive to her husband. Um, but there are a lot of unnamed ladies who played a, an important role during the Revolutionary War because women bought all of the things, right? They made the things for their home. They cooked. So they had to buy food and they had to buy cloth to make clothing. So some of those women didn't have a lot of power because maybe at the time they couldn't write, but they could make things and they definitely supported their household by um, buying cloth or buying tea. And I'm sure you've heard about tea during the Revolutionary War, it was shipped in from Great Britain. So people wanted to boycott it. That means they didn't want to buy it. They didn't want to buy British products. So there's this group called the Daughters of Liberty. And guess what they did? They boycotted those British products and they worked to make their own. So I want you to look around your house in honor of the Daughters of Liberty and see if you can find something inspired by them in your house. Maybe a tea bag or some coffee or a shirt. So I found a tea towel. I didn't have a tea bag, but I found a tea towel. So I did find some cloth because what they did at that time was they made their own cloth. So they worked to make their own things and keep from purchasing things from the British. And I love this really fun print inspired by them. Okay, so African Americans were also part of the picture at the time, right? Many of them at the time were enslaved. And the woman up on the screen, Phyllis Wheatley, started her life as an enslaved young woman. But she also learned to read and write thanks to the people who owned her and eventually freed her. And she became one of the most inspiring poets of the time of the Revolutionary War. And you would say, hey, like art is really important, right? During a time of crisis, a time of war. And she wrote an important um, a poem about George Washington and eventually met George Washington, but she also really spoke about her experience as being of an enslaved woman and formerly enslaved woman and talking about how important it was for African Americans to be seen um, as people and having the same liberties that the people, the colonists of the United States were asking for. So she is a really important woman that not so many people have heard of. So she was a poet. So um, like 
first lady, um, Abigail Adams. I want you to look around and see maybe if you have even more writing utensils, right? Do you have a pencil, a pen, something to write with in honor of Phyllis Wheatley? And if you are interested in Phyllis, there are actually some really cool, there's a really cool picture book out there about her too. So I have one more and it's someone we talked about. So this is, I was just mentioning that Sybil Lundengard has a really cool monument in her honor. And I love how activated she is with her stick. Remember her stick that she was using to bang on the houses and her horse star is in action and she's ready to go. So here she is. And remember, she had to deal with the rain, right? And I wanted you to look for something in your house that would keep you dry or warm if you were like Sybil. And I don't think I remembered my thing. I had an umbrella with me and I think I actually took it outside to use it today. So maybe I'll put my hat back on to keep me nice and warm or protected, at least from both the sun and the rain. But tell me what you can find around your house. Can you find a raincoat, a hat, an umbrella, some boots inspired by Sybil? So those are some women who played some really cool roles in the Revolutionary War. And I will share my results because I didn't do that earlier because I had these all as one big poll. And you can see some of the things that people collected in honor of these revolutionary gals. We've got Q-tips and cotton balls, stamps and pens, hats, a quarter, a dollar bill. So maybe you want to um, create your own um, dollar bill or um, coin inspired by one of these women. Um, and let's see, tea towels, coffee, tea bags, pen, paper. So that is our activities for this evening, celebrating First Ladies and our independence. And I did see some questions in the chat. I know someone was asking specifically about, um, and my spelling may be wrong on Sybil. I'm so sorry for that. Um, someone might be asking about uh, what was happening at the White House during certain times for celebration. So Thomas Jefferson established the celebration of July 4th at the White House, but um, Adams even earlier said as the Declaration of Independence was signed that, hey, I think we should be celebrating with fireworks in the future. This is a really big moment. And then Jefferson actually didn't have a first lady. So he had women in his family who served as a hostess, including Dolly Madison. So someone mentioned the White House being on fire. Um, Dolly Madison actually served as a hostess during Jefferson's time. So that's why I said, it was probably Dolly Madison who helped host um, the very first July 4th celebration at the White House. But I'm not sure if she would have done that while she was First Lady, um, given w the conflicts that were happening at the White House part of that time. But those celebrations went far into the, the 19th century. Um, that the White House was opened up and people are, were welcome to the White House, that the president and often the first lady were there to greet them, um, that there were um, festive parties with music um, and celebration on the lawn. And then sometimes the president and first lady weren't there. Sometimes it's a really long weekend and they use it to travel and enjoy themselves. So it wasn't until more recently um, that the, um, the White House was kind of opened up to um, staff and celebrations um, 
uh, weren't always involving the first family, but they were always happening on that White House lawn. So hopefully that answers some of the questions that adults have. And again, some of you out there, some of your adults may know even more about the Revolutionary War um, and may be able to answer questions. Um, so again, um, Sybil's Night Ride was the story we read tonight. We talked about first ladies um, at the White House and their celebration of Independence Day. And I hope that you all have a great Independence Day and we'll be sending you um, out the information for our art activity tonight. Um, so you can follow along as well as some information about the women that we discussed in our um, little scavenger hunt. So I hope you had a great time. If you enjoyed yourself, please go to our Eventbrite page and check out some of our other activities. Um, our First Lady Kids for Kids are going to be really cool and fun. And I am looking forward to connecting with you all soon through Future Fun with Flotus. And I hope you have a great 4th of July. Um, and I am looking forward to lots of fireworks and cookouts this weekend and let us know on our Facebook page what you end up doing. If you end up making fireworks in a jar because it's raining or if you go outside and enjoy the fireworks. So happy 4th of July and we'll see you next time um, from the National First Ladies Library and Allison here um, with Fun with Flotus. Thank you so much everyone. It was great to See you virtually.